Continuing coverage right now with Call 6 investigator Rafael Sanchez. Rafael, you've been here all night long looking into the background of the suspect, Major Davis Jr. What can you tell us about him? A mark, good morning. Major Davis Jr. was initially pronounced dead after an exchange of gunfire with police, but he was revived by first responders. As of 2 this morning, he's recovering from surgery, and we're told that he's in critical condition. I spent hours on the phone and looking through public records to learn more about the man accused of killing a veteran officer. The police encounter at 34th and Forest Manor is the latest time that Major Davis Jr. was at odds with the law. In May 2006, Metro Police stopped Davis near his home on North Gale. The then 16-year-old was arrested for reckless driving and possession of nearly two grams of crack cocaine. It just happens that the officer who sent him to the juvenile center was Greg Milburn. Milburn was shot while on duty this past May by a separate individual. In March 2007, the dangerous drug section team of IMPD served a warrant on a home. There, police arrested Davis and another man on possession of cocaine and two SKS rifles. The other suspect claimed he owned the weapons. In 2008, Davis was arrested for dealing drugs on a scooter. Police seized five grams of marijuana and $888 in cash from the then 19-year-old. In 2010, a traffic stop led to the discovery of a vehicle with hidden compartments. Davis was not arrested and was allowed to drive away. This morning, we've also learned that the officer killed Perry Wren just happened to have a brief contact with the Davis family 11 years ago, Major's father died of a heart attack, but the family blamed police for his death. Officer Wren was among the three dozen officers who responded to that scene back on May the 27th, 2003. Live in the newsroom, I'm Call 6 investigator Rafael Sanchez. Rafael Sanchez looking into the background there. Thank you. Only on RTV6, toxic trouble in homes in central Indiana, and there is no way for you to see or smell the problem. A scented candle or a fresh coat of paint could initially hide the danger. Tonight, Call 6 investigator Rafael Sanchez has more on a family forced to flee their home and why they may not be alone. Unless you have a police report or a nosy neighbor, you could make a six-figure mistake involving a home. Unless you look at the walls, the carpeting, and even the air vents, they hold the truth that someone may try to hide from you. These are the moments that tug at their hearts. Birthdays, campfires, family time. This house in Mooresville is where Chris and Jennifer Nugent wanted to retire. After buying it in May 2013, the former Marine and his wife remodeled and repainted it. We had the whole house actually fully inspected by an inspection company. And, you know, there's no termite, no mold. You know, there was nothing. Despite that, their kids were often sick months later. There were doctor's visits for coughing, diarrhea, and vomiting. Their dog suddenly died of cancer, and the parents were overcome with unexplainable fatigue. We were extremely short of breath. Yeah. That but that's another thing, thing is everybody felt like they were having asthma attacks. None They're of us have asthma. There. This past February, the couple bought two do-it-yourself test kits that would change their lives. Results show their home is contaminated with meth. Rooms upstairs are three times above the state accepted standards and downstairs nearly 18 times above safe levels. They just purposely poisoned our children. I don't know how people can do that. Shame on them. It's so unsafe, the couple uses a face mask and gloves to get items they can take out. The Nugents are now stuck. A limbo only a lawsuit can resolve. The seller's realty company, Carpenter Realtors, does not believe it or its listing agents should be held responsible. State police records show no meth reports at the address to identify a suspect. Our best guess is that we actually find maybe 20% of the labs that are operational. Since 2007, more than 3,400 homes, apartments, and outbuildings have been identified as a meth lab in Indiana, and our state could lead the nation again in the number of related busts. That's the visible. The invisible is the actual number of homes 
polluting. They can have significant amounts of contamination in these homes and never know it. There, there might not be any staining because they didn't spill anything or they did clean up after themselves. Like I said, the vast majority is through the gas and so that, that's how it gets into the walls, into the carpet and into the, the air systems. If, if we as law enforcement never know that there was a lab there, then there's, there's no way for that homeowner to know either. Meth is so hazardous, the cleanup can cost as much as $10,000. The Nugent's insurance company, Indiana Farm Bureau, rejected their claim, citing their policies have a pollution and latent defect exclusions. At crisis cleaning, they're hearing from more people shocked to find out meth was cooked in the home they bought. We've tested homes that people have cleaned with bleach and they are still above the state limit. So bleach does not solve this meth issue. The state certified business decontaminates properties with meth. The cleaning and retesting can take up to two weeks. The Nugents are at a loss. Their home unlivable. Their frustration unwavering with the people who put them on this road. I hope God has mercy on her soul. <laughs> I mean, no one should be able to get away with this. A meth test is not part of the home inspection process. It is optional, if even rarely offered to people, but it only costs about $50, and so it can save you so much more money than having to clean up the home from contamination, of course, medical bills, and of course, everyone wants to be inside their home as opposed, as opposed to being forced out. As for those who try to hide meth from buyers and, and, and other people, it is hard to get out of the carpeting, the walls, and the air vents, and that's where the test comes in. Erica, now back to you. Now to a shocking discovery from our Call 6 investigators. It stems from this video, an Indiana police chief accidentally shooting himself. The cause, something you would never expect. And the situation could put you in danger. Call 6 investigator Rafael Sanchez now with our exclusive report. Rafael? Erica, good evening. Gun owners already take great pride in safety, but what you wear may lead to trouble with your trigger. Pulling into Wolf's gun shop, David Counselor was looking for a deal. This deal totally caught me off guard. His entire shopping experience caught on surveillance cameras. Behind the counter, owner Jim Wolf had plenty to sell. I've been in business 34 years, and this is the first time that has happened, or I've seen it happen. At 10:20:39, David looked at a 380 automatic. At 10:21:15, he pulled out his Glock 23 to compare it with the gun that caught his eye. After he put his Glock back in his holster, watch as he tugs on his jacket. Within seconds, his gun accidentally goes off. In slow motion, you can see the brief flash as the bullet strikes his body. 911, what's your emergency? I uh, need an ambulance up here. A guy's been shot in the leg. A guy's been shot in the leg? Yeah. This picture shows the gunshot injury to David's leg. He was treated and released from the hospital and returned to work. He just happens to be in his seventh year as the Connersville police chief. I was embarrassed and humiliated. The accidental shooting involved a Glock 23. The chief carries the department-issued firearm while off duty. On the clock, he depends on a Glock 22. Despite a slight difference in size, both have the same safety feature. Here it is. This piece of metal must be pressed down to fire the weapons. If I'm going on the side of the trigger over here, mm -hmm. it's not going, to, not going to go off. Your whole finger has to be in here to push that, this little lever, so to speak, down on the trigger to go. On the day of the shooting, his hands were not on the trigger, but his fleece jacket's drawstring found its way into his holster. When pulling up on that jacket, this thing comes up, basically, and, and uh, it hits that safety and, and fired. Based on the store security video, an internal police report concluded that his jacket's drawstring caused the weapon to fire. The Glock Company website claims 65% of the country's law enforcement uses one of their guns. That includes the FBI. Agents carry Glock 23s. Around the country, other police departments out west, Arizona, California, in the Midwest, Missouri, and out east in Maryland, they're armed with Glock 22s. It's what Metro Police and the Circle City have on their hip, as do deputies with the Marion County Sheriff's Office in Indianapolis and the Marion County Sheriff's Office in Salem, Oregon.
you know, been around uh, guns all my life. I'm a military veteran. Deputy Steve Cooper accidentally shot himself in 2005 with his Glock 22. While getting out of his cruiser, his gun fired, injuring his lower right leg. For a day or two there, they're even thinking at amputation. An Oregon State Police investigation cleared him, but pointed to his windbreaker's drawstring for getting caught in his trigger guard. When it initially happened, I was I was certain there was there was four people in the car, and I was certain someone else had done it. Um, and when they told me no, you know, it was your own gun, I, it was pretty embarrassing. I feel like if I can uh, prevent it from happening to somebody else, then uh, I can get some good out of what's been a, a bad situation for me. You know, I've got uh, permanent damage to my leg and uh, and my ego, and uh, might as well uh, you know try to make some good out of it. A jacket drawstring also made for a bad day for a deputy in Louisiana. Gunzone.com shared these pictures from 2005 with the Call 6 investigators. These show the aftermath of an accidental shooting involving a Glock 23. Watch what you're doing when you're handling the firearm, because the clothing could play a factor in it. At Wolf's Gun Store, they've kept the remains of the runaway bullet, and they'll need a remnant to cover the hole in their carpet, while their customer, the chief, recovers from his injury. This is coming from my heart here. I don't want to see nobody go through what I did because I don't, I don't want to see anybody get hurt or killed. So to that end, the chief counselor's biggest concern is the what if. What if that gun store was packed in January and someone was injured? He wants to prevent that in the future. The chief has been in the spotlight, though, before. In 1999, he accidentally shot himself in the hand while assembling a different gun he thought was unloaded. So what is the fix to the Glock and the drawstring? Very easy fix. For example, this is the RTV6 jacket, and my jacket has one of the toggle drawstrings. Right. So right. if you have a jacket or a fleece or a sweater with the drawstring, take a pair of scissors, cut it, you've now reduced the risk. So if this is a problem that's going to be over your gun, just take it away. You've just reduced the problem. Very easy. And what does the gun manufacturer say about this issue? We did reach out to Glock and Glock uh, to the company. We did so in writing and by telephone weeks before the airing of the story. We have yet to hear from the company. We have posted all of our emails with Glock so that you can read them for yourselves and all the information that we requested from the company. I'll be online tomorrow morning to answer all viewer questions on Facebook. So join me on that conversation uh, tomorrow morning here on the IndyChannel.com. All right. Very good. Possibly life-saving information, Rafael. Thank you. All new at 5.30, May is known for its traditions here in Indianapolis. Yeah, we just wrapped up the biggest racing uh, spectacle in the world. And on a smaller scale, a large indie family puts on their own event. Our TV6's Rafael Sanchez is live in the newsroom with a spectacle on a smaller scale. Right, Rafael? And Erica, this is quite a sight. You have to see this. This event begins with qualifications and the Pledge of Allegiance. Tonight, the Indianapolis family who gathers in the backyard and makes memories on this Memorial Day. Gentlemen, start your engines! Yeah! That call begins a 24-year tradition for the Gwynn family. Every Monday after the greatest spectacle in racing, they hold... The greatest event in backyard racing. <laughs> this year, five remote control vehicles in the backyard field. This is very stressful. This is immensely. I take my mind off. Ah, oh, crash! No, just kidding. Oh! <laughs> ah. Their drivers perched above the track. Very, very greasy out there, so you got to be very careful and watch your speed and try to keep it under control. Keep it going in a circle. Spotters clear the occasional wreck. We're next to the grandstand. They're doing some uh, reconstruction to the grandstand, and uh, we're just over here in the grandstand. And uh, yeah, we get these seats every year. Did you ever think that these race cars would bring you together? In a way, yes, more because of the young guys. I got 11 boys, so you know how that is, and four girls. So, have you already bought your tickets for next year? Yeah, I'm, a, I'm the first one. So you're a season ticket holder? Season ticket holder. These race fans mingle, munch, and create memories. <laughs> After 500 laps, the winner's name gets etched into a trophy. There's no milk or money like at the 500, but there is plenty of mileage on bragging rights until 2015. Oh. 
This year's winner was Jerry Ray, who won last year, so he gets all the bragging rights, followed by Hank, William, John, and James. The family's expecting more vehicles to take the field next year for the 25th running of the greatest event in backyard racing. And as we always promise here on RTV6, we're the only place to see the race. Live in the newsroom, Rafael Sanchez, RTV6. All right, thank you, Rafael.